Green on Container Gardening. And thank you so much for everyone joining us today. And today we're doing a collaboration with our club and the Environmental Policy Committee from ASI. So if this is your first time here, welcome. If you're, if you're coming back, thank you so much. Um, today our agenda is going to be um, first introducing the Environmental Policy Committee. So if you don't know who they are, you'd know a little bit more about them. Also just talking about um, what is the Edible Garden Club and if you're interested, there are open positions. So we will, we will go over that. And there is a raffle today. So we will be dropping the form halfway through the presentation um, and also introducing our special guest today. All right, thank you, Andrea. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Lampkin. I am the Environmental Affairs Commissioner of the EPC. Um, so the EPC is an ASI committee uh, dedicated to um, making the campus more environmentally sustainable. Um, adopting um, environmentally conscious policies and just educating the student body about environmental issues. Um, if you would like to join the EPC, we have open positions. Um, you can follow us at the CSULA EPC. I, I will put that in the chat right now. Um, that is on Instagram. And from there, you can go use the link to um, apply to the committee. Um, if you're a committee member, you get a $20 gift card for every um, one of our committee meetings. So, you know, there's an incentive there <laughs> and you get to be part of a great organization that you can put on your resume. Uh, next slide, Andrea. And the EPC has some upcoming events. So obviously today we have our container gardening workshop and then um, April 16th through the 19th. Um, Andrea, would you like to talk about this event? I'm muted. Okay. Um, so there will be a, um, oh, is it the garden tour that we're going to have on campus? Oh, I was talking about the April 16th through 19th. I'm not sure. Did you put this one, Estefania, the 18th annual? So this is actually from Yvonne's website, and she was offering it um, the 18th annual Theater of Pain Native Garden Tour. So if you're interested in celebrating Earth uh, Week, then you can definitely check that out. And Okay, Let me add awesome. one note that is a virtual tour. Mm -hmm. and, you know, before COVID days, there were real live visits to uh, 20, 30, 40 gardens um, split into a couple days, like one day in the Pasadena, Altadena area, and the next day out towards Santa Monica. So since COVID, they have put it right online. So if you go to Theodore Payne, um, foundation they will uh, the website there you can sign in for it and it is starting so um today uh, but it goes on for the three days so you're welcome to join in but it's a great um, avenue for figuring out what some native plants will look like after a couple years so that you can determine whether or not they're going to be good choices for your garden Mm, awesome okay. thank you sounds good and then uh april 21st we have the we have a virtual tour of the edible garden space on campus um so be sure to go to that and then april 22nd there is a, a csu wide earth day event um and it's a an environmental justice panel with uh, youth leaders. Um, so it sounds really interesting. So be sure to go to that one also. And then April 28th through April 30th, the EPC is having an Arbor Day celebration on our Instagram. So we're gonna have you guys send in pictures of you with a tree, pretty much just, um, you know, it could be a native tree, whatever you want, just tell us what it is. And then you have the chance to win a gift card from that. And then May 7th, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. we're having a, uh, um, an event called Trash Your Treasures. We're going to teach you guys how to make your own gardening pot out of a two liter soda bottle and then we're going to decorate it together. It's going to be real fun. We're just going to hang out and chill out and, you know, reuse some trash. <laughs> Next slide, Andrea. Okay, so if um, you are new to the Edible Garden Club, I um, just want to 
give you guys a little rundown. This is a quote from our past president, um, Alicia. She said, Te uh, teach students to grow organic and sustainable food for the purpose of conducting research and empowering connections to envir environmental stewardship, food access, and community health. So being a part of the Edible Garden Club, um, you get to be a part of developing um, presentations like this and reaching out to um, so many key players in the edible garden world, such as Yvonne, as we have her here today. Um, also, uh, we get the opportunity to um, either do your own presentation on stuff that you care about and that happens in edible garden world. Um, I think this semester, me and Ryan did our own presentation that pertained to our own majors, and it was pretty cool. So. Um, let me see. We are offering um, open positions for next semester, which is fall 2021. We are currently looking for a secretary, treasurer, and student outreach. And there will be other um, positions that we're looking for because we are looking to expand um, our board that we have right now. And so to join our club, we offer a space to grow and have very important discussions, whether it's tackling problems of food insecurity or food accessibility. Um, even just learning how to cook and different ingredients, learning about vegetables or learning about dirt and rocks and all that kind of stuff. Um, ability to present ideas and topics that you're interested in. Um, we give you a comfortable space um, to present your ideas um, in a low pressure environment. So um, when I presented, I didn't feel like I was presenting to a professor and I didn't feel like I was um, freaking out because you are presenting to a group of friends and um, it's just really cool. Um, and you get to be a part of a new club at Cal State LA. Though we have been around for about a year, we are still a very new club and still developing. And you could be a part of that. And you could um, bring new ideas, ideas that um, our current board we haven't thought of before. And um, if you do would like, if you would like to join us, we have our email right there, which is ediblegardenclub.calstateLA at gmail.com. Or you could DM us on Instagram, um, very just like, casual just dm us and be like hey i'm thinking about joining and we'll send you the forms or whatever you need to do um so yeah and um i think i'll just i'll go over the raffle uh five students who fill out a form which will be sent halfway throughout the meeting today so um i think it's gonna be like around two o'clock we're gonna have like a break um, five students who fill out the form, um, and you have to be a Cal State LA student, will receive a $50 Amazon gift card. Um, winners will be announced at the end of the presentation, but if you have to leave early, that is no worries. We will send you an email if you are the winner, so look out for that. Oh, I just also wanted to say really quick about the raffle. Um, about halfway through, uh, we're going to be taking a break, so I will send the link for that. Uh, we understand if you guys have to leave, you know, if you can't stay for the full two hours. Um, so, yeah, we just wanted to respect your time, but also make sure that, you know, you guys did stay for some of the event, you know, more than half. But um, I will send that out and then you guys just fill it out and we will, um, you know, do the raffle at the end of the presentation. So hi everyone, my name is Estefania. I wanna thank you all for attending. I am the secretary of the Edible Garden Club. And as Andrea and Ryan previously mentioned, um, we're gonna have a short minute, uh, five minute break in between uh, just to let everyone um, stretch and use the bathroom, whatever they have to do. And then I also wanna remind everyone to feel free to leave your questions in the chat. I noticed you were already using it pretty well. So keep doing that. And we'll address all of those questions for Yvonne towards the end. And I'm sure many of you have heard that next week is Earth, Earth Week. And so from April 19th through the 23rd uh, with the upcoming events that we shared and in in anticipation of next week, we reached out to Yvonne, who is a UC former gardener coordinator to teach us about container gardening. And we wanted to provide a presentation that would make growing accessible to everyone, despite having a limited space with wherever they live. For those who didn't know, Yvonne is a fellow Cal State LA alumni. She has sprouted seeds in community and school gardens for over 60 years in Southern and Northern California. And before she retired in 2015, she taught 1,100 master gardeners. And the main goal of the organization is to help the LA County residents to have a sustainable food source. And after she retired, Yvonne launched her website, gardeninginla.net, where she offers events 
and job opportunities and a blog to teach novice and expert gardeners on various gardening topics. Today, Yvonne is making a second guest appearance as a continuation of the seasonal vegetable gardening presentation that she gave about a week ago. And I'm pleased to hand over the floor to Yvonne so she can start off her presentation. Well, thanks so much, Stefania. Uh, this has been a, a real treat for me, uh, kind of having a second life at Cal State LA, uh, just because you guys have formulated an edible gardening club. And that is just really makes me feel good um, that all these years later, there's something good happening on campus that I particularly am passionate about. So let me um, tell you a couple more things about what's on my website. Um, when I was uh, managing the Master Gardener program and we were developing it um, over some 20 years, um, we developed an email list. And this was, it started out when there wasn't even any computers. We were just sending things out to um, a mailing list with those mailing labels. So you can tell how much has changed since then. But we, um, over the years, we developed the program, really paying close attention to what the volunteers uh, were involved in in their own lives, their own neighborhoods, and how they were helping at community gardens and school gardens. And we just tried to make our program with the training of the specifics of gardening to help them accomplish what they were already trying to do within their neighborhoods. So um, on my website, I've got the uh, uh, gardening events that come up. Uh, and of course, most of them are virtual at this point, um, have been just like for the past year. But also there are news items, things that I've found relative to gardening that I've thought are very intriguing to gardeners. So I list those. There's monthly tips um, that I've developed over the last 40 years and it, and through my garden here in Pasadena. And the blog is something I do about every two weeks. I go up into the garden and I take lots of photographs and then I chat on about what's going on in my garden. There's also some bigger articles like troubleshooting for summer crops and winter crops and um, container gardening, uh, recycling items relative to uh, your next presentation. Uh, there's recycling and repurposing household throwaways into new garden tools. And the um, presentation of that that first was available. It was when Heel Hauser came to my garden and went through the article. And that is listed under my web links uh, menu item. And on the right hand column is my uh, Yvonne's web appearances. And so the first one there is the presentation. Um, it's really that video that Heel prepared uh, and showed on TV for all those years since 1994. So you'll look that uh, he actually has color in his hair and uh, both of us look a lot younger than we do now. So anyway, the uh, web link section is a, a great resource um, and the whole thing is really nice. So if you'd like to receive notices, emails of uh, when I'm posting those various items, um, just email me at gardeninla at gmail.com and I'll add you to the mailing list. So let's move ahead to container gardening. Okay. So indoors and outdoors. Um, most of this is outdoors, but it is applicable to indoors as well. And I do bring up some specific points about indoor gardening. However, you have to remember that indoors is not gonna be anywhere near as successful as outdoors 
most of the time we are dealing with edibles and that's going to be the flowers and the fruits uh, that are on the plants. Um, things like lettuce and those things, the, the herbs that we eat, um, just the foliage part, those will be more likely to get actually a crop off of it because you only need a minimum of six hours direct sun in order to get a good crop on there. And even when things are indoors on a windowsill, it's um, pretty hit or miss whether you're going to get that amount of uh, sun to be able to get the plant to be really growing. So let me talk a little bit about the variety of containers that are in this photo. You'll see that there's some really tiny ones here that are maybe only five or six inches. Um, and it's always more important to get a deeper planter than a broad one. Like these here, which are very broad, it might be a good uh, 18 inches across, but only six or seven inches um, deep. And this is going to be a problematic during our summers because with the tremendous heat that we do get, the potting soil in these containers that are shallow, will it'll be drying it out and you may have to be out there watering it twice or three times a day just to keep that potting soil moist so that the roots of the plants have something to be able to um, drink the moisture and the fertilizers from. So you really have to match your plant with the kind of container. Um, here we have some strawberries um, that are in maybe a six inch deep, but it is a little broader. Um, consequently, being able to fill this with water every other day or so is what's going to be necessary in order to keep that potting mix fully saturated. This here that has a tomato plant in it is probably more like two feet deep and two feet across. So that's going to be more what the tomato uh, plant is going to be needing. Um, if a tomato is planted in the regular soil and you kept it well uh, watered and fertilized, those roots could go down three feet. So it really is something that you don't want to crowd too many plants into a container. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So why or why not use a container instead of putting it in the soil? Well, number one, of course, uh, you can put a container just about anywhere, um, on a patio or a balcony or a hanging from a fence or on some steps, but you do have to pay attention to the amount of light, the amount of sun that you get. Because if a begonia, for example, which just takes filtered light, you don't wanna have that in the direct sun, except if it's very early in the morning or very late in the afternoon where it might get only an, an hour or two of direct sun but otherwise is pretty um, bright light. Number two, you can move containers during each of the seasons or just to follow or avoid the direct sun, um, which of course you can't do with a plant that's in the ground. It's stuck there in that one place. You can move containers for your enjoyment when the flowers are in bloom, um, for example, if you have a pot full of tulip bulbs or anything that is going to be blooming, perhaps you will want to have it by your front door only when it is in bloom or when it's fruiting. But other than that, it might just look like a green plant to you that is, doesn't have much interest and consequently you move it out of that space for the rest of the time. You also have the advantage with a container that you can create a special soil mix. 
for example, blueberries need very, very acidic soil mix. And orchids need just uh, chunky bark or sphagnum moss to have in its container because it needs to hold the moisture but also drain it so that there's a lot of air in between the pieces that are what we would call the soil mix. Some disadvantages are that you've got a captive plant that roots are restricted to just that container. So if it's a small container, um, the roots could fill up that container pretty quickly. And consequently, it doesn't have much in the way of potting soil or um, water because it runs right out. Containers are also sensitive to the weather. Um, the heat, the cold, the wind, any kind of ventilation or lack of ventilation. Um, and consequently, because they're not connected to the earth and which moderates all those different things, um, they can be um, problematic for those plants. Also containers need frequent irrigation and fertilization. Um, just because it's, a, again, it's captive and it cannot, those roots cannot reach out into um, the native soil. The other thing is that they do recruit, I'm sorry, they do require root pruning and repotting because the roots grow right up next to the edge and it literally pushes out a lot of the soil in there and consequently, it can't get the nutrition and the moisture that it really needs. So you have to re-prune it, um, cutting off about an inch or two around the entire root ball, and then repotting it with new um, soil mix. So what type of container? <laughs> Excuse me. You do need to have drainage holes in the container because you're going to be watering it and the water is going to moisten the soil mix and then run out. The other thing that you can do, however, for example, with this pot, this is a very large container. Um, it's clay with the, um, uh, I'm trying, I'm saying glaze, but that isn't the, um, the ceramic on the outside, um, and it does not have a hole in the bottom of the pot. And consequently, uh, there's no way to have any drainage off that. So what you do is you plant the plant in a separate container that maybe almost is the size of the decorative container so that when you water it, it'll drain right out and the water will settle at the bottom of the outside decorative container. However, you do need to dump that water every once in a while. Also, what you can do is get horticultural charcoal and put an inch of it at the bottom of the container. And what that does is it, it uh, clarifies the water so that the water doesn't spoil down there at the base of it. It's like a filter. You know, you've heard of the charcoal filters that you fit onto your faucet in your kitchen. Uh, well, this is the same kind of process. It's the charcoal that clarifies the water. Size of the container, you always want as big a container as possible to allow those roots to have more space to grow. And you always want it deeper rather than wider. Remember that in that first slide, that's why I talked about the evaporation of the water. You want it to be able to hold the water in the organic matter that's in the potting mix in order to drain properly, in order to have those roots um, which kind of come and go inside that potting mix in both the open air and the moisture particles that have absorbed the water. 
the material and the color, um, if it's a dark color, it's going to absorb more of the heat, especially if it's in the sun. Um, and even in a regular um, uh, terracotta planter, that's going to what is called breathing. It's going to breathe more easily as opposed to a glazed pot like this, uh, which holds it, the water in more. So it will mean that you will need to pay close attention to how frequently to water it, whether it's a completely open pot or whether it's closed like this one. And hanging baskets are always great fun, but you do have to pay attention to um, watering a lot more frequently just because there's so much evaporation. And of course, you can always take your garden with you. This is my succulent collection that I always have to repot about every five years because it ends up just growing into a complete jungle. So what I love about that process, um, this of course was my first big project when COVID hit and we had to stay at home. Well, this was my, my excuse to have to spend about three weeks um, repotting and uh, taking cuttings of different kinds of plants that had expanded and potting them up. So I always love being able to match um, a particular texture of a, of a plant or a color um, and match it with a particular pot that I really like. So it makes it, um, you know, this is your time when you can practice your artistry of matching colors and textures. So how much sun? I had briefly mentioned this. If you're only growing foliage, like with lettuce, or even many of these um, succulents here, um, you really need only six hours of sun each day because you're just growing the plant. Whereas if it's going to be developing flowers and then perhaps fruit the way edibles will, you need at least eight hours of sun a day. And this might make sense if you just think in terms, it's growing the plant, but now it has to do something extra. It has to put out flowers and then those flowers have to get pollinated and then the fruit has to set and mature. So think in terms of a tomato plant. You're not just growing the foliage part, but it has to put out the blossoms. The blossoms have to get pollinated. The little fruit may or may not get set. And then developing the fruit may take a whole nother two months. So consequently, that's why you need at least two more hours of sun every day in order to get the flowers and the fruit, which means the food. Now, of course, this may be difficult to provide indoors, which is why foliage plants are the ones that are more um, likely to be utilized as indoor house plants. Um, and house plants um, can stay outside in a bright shade area. Again, not much direct sun. Um, and like this year, we had so little uh, real cold weather, um, barely under 45 degrees at, at my house here in Pasadena. And on my front porch, there's a big oak tree. So it shades the entire area, but it is what's called filtered light because as the sun moves in between all the leaves, it coming down, it, you know, each moment may be different. It might be in the shade of a particular leaf or it may be in the sun, but only for a moment or two and then it moves on. So I had my orchids and my, um, uh, African violets 
and some of the other tender plants that I would have been purchased as house plants, but I kept them all outdoors all winter long. And now, of course, with the warming temperatures, they're actually starting to thrive again. So this one here is a bougainvillea um, that has been planted in a garbage can with holes punched in the bottom, of course. And so it's getting all that sun. So it's putting out its blossoms. Here, this begonia, this is called an escargot, which of course means snail because it's curling around here like a snail. Um, this one is a bright light situation, and this is done fine under the oak tree. Whereas many of these little succulents here, um, this is all in the bright sun. So each one of these will have blossoms coming up, although none of them uh, put out fruit that's edible. So what kind of soil mix? Um, you don't want to use dirt. Um, dirt is a problem because it potentially has the disease spores um, and weed seeds, and it's just too heavy. Um, you know, there are plants like tomato plants that you can put in the soil um, in the garden, but also you can put them in a container. So it might seem puzzling why you could use dirt in the garden, but not in the container. And that's really just because of the potential problem for the diseases and the weeds to take the upper hand in the pot. But because again, you've got a captive um, plant here. And so you want to prepare whatever the best kind of soil mix is going to be or literally soilless mix. So best to buy a potting mix that is high quality, it's sterilized, and it's made of organic ingredients. Like you read the um, contents and it's really just a matter of fern and bark and good stuff like that, that will break down and provide the um, nutrients as well as the feeding that you do of the plant. So when you put your potting mix in your, um, in your pot, and then you plant the plant right in the center here or around the edge, be sure to leave about a good inch of space at the top because that's going to be where you fill it with water every time you do water it. And it sinks down, it, or moistens the, all the potting mix and then either exits out of the base or um, you just water it several times. Each time you do though, just because fill it up, let it go through the potting mix, then fill it up again and possibly even a third time just to make sure that the, all that potting mix really gets moistened. Because many times what happens is that the um, roots kind of grow into the soil mix and it kind of clumps up. And then when you water, the water just goes on the outside and never really gets on the inside of the potting soil. So you need to just kind of um, work the soil mix, cultivate it a little bit off the top just to make sure that the water goes in. So what can we grow? Vegetables. Um, here is a hydroponic system. Um, this is called a grow pot. And what it is, is that it has um, um, pellets that are of wool in there or uh, lava rock. Uh, there's different systems that you put the water in the hole here and it keeps the whole base uh, Full of water that is fertilized, and then the roots um, reach down into that water, but it, it moves out so that um, it does get a lot of oxygen as well. Here is lemongrass. 
um, that does like to be very packed into a container. So many plants that get to be this many in there, you would split it and give some to friends or um, certainly put into a larger container or several containers. But some plants do like to be root bound and this is one of them. Here's a little pea plant that literally is eight inches tall and that's it. Um, you probably get only a dozen little peas off of it. However, um, it is one way to be able to have a, a small garden um, and have your peas. Here is a raised bed that's been set into the grass with an open bottom to it um, so that there's several kinds of lettuce that's growing here and perhaps a, a sage and tomatoes and all sorts of good stuff. Um, here is a, this is the side using the concrete blocks as the side of a raised bed and it's turned with the direction such that these leeks are planted into um, this one opening in the concrete block. And because leeks do fine with super hot soil, and temperatures that it will develop just fine as long as it gets watered well. Um, this is a, uh, a trough, um, like for uh, watering horses and animals and things. It's got a pump in it, which comes all the way up and then releases down into this row these are all rain gutters that have been installed so that each one has a different angle to it so that the water runs through and then goes down into the next one. So you end up with all of this lettuce or spinach or whatever the small plant might be that you want. And then it releases any extra water that finally makes it to the end, it releases it back into um, the trough. So it keeps, it's definitely a sustainable um, recycling system. And then what you can do is put fertilizer into it um, so that it fertilizes the plants as well as just moistening them. So fruit bushes and fruit trees as well as ornamental trees. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at my handout and I see there's um, something I wanted to mention to you and that is on the handout uh, under vegetables, there is a, um, a batch of three different depths of containers. Um, I don't know. See this um, portion on the handout. Um, it has the a 12 inch deep container. Uh, you would plant beets, bok choy, carrots, garlic, leaf lettuce, onions, radishes, spinach, strawberries, and chard in an 18 inch container. You would plant beans, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, cucumbers, eggplant, peas, peppers, and squash. And then in a 24 inch deep container, which is probably about what this one here is that has grapes in it, blackberries, blueberries, potatoes, and tomatoes because each of those plants are a different depth, a different bulk of root system to them. So if you tried to put a tomato in a little 12 inch pot, you'd have a hard time. Well, the plant would have a hard time and consequently you probably wouldn't get very many fruit. So that's why it's important to really match um, um, what the plant needs in terms of its root zone area 
and the size of the container that you provide. So fruits and ornamentals. Here we've got a grape uh, vine that was put into this container in this spot before they built this overhead um, shade structure. And consequently, because this plant now no longer gets direct sun, it makes a very nice foliage plant, but there's no grapes to it. So that is why you need to be cognizant of just how much um, direct sun there is. And recognizing that through the year, as the sun moves, it's going to um, be bright at some times and not at others, and that's going to change throughout the year. So this big container is fine again. This has a kumquat tree here, which has a relatively small root system to it. And what they've done at the top of the container here is plant a whole bunch of little succulents that don't take much water. They certainly don't take much fertilizer. But what they will do here is keep any evaporation of the water that will all be going for the kumquat tree. Now, the roots of all of these little succulents here only goes down about maybe four or five inches. And the whole bottom of the pot will be for the roots of the kumquat tree. So therefore you have the depth, six inches as opposed to a whole foot maybe, uh, even two feet, um, that's dedicated to each kind of plant. And therefore, um, both are going to be able to coexist in that um, pot. What you don't want is to plant two different kinds of plants that both are very shallow or both are very deep. Because then they're competing for the same moisture and the nutrition. So this ornamental here is absolutely stuffed into this container but it seems to be relatively happy. So it must not need very much in terms of uh, moisture or uh, fertilizer. However, I do see the wire here from the drip irrigation that is hooked up to it. So that may be one reason. It may be a very frequent, maybe every day for maybe five minutes, just to keep the whole root ball moist there. Flowers, there's many, many kinds. Um, but again, you have to match the environment that it's going to be in with the kind of a plant and for that size of container. Here we've got about the same size container for this begonia, which really needs bright light, but not any direct sun. And this geranium, which can take all the sun in the world and really doesn't have much of a problem if you don't water it for a week or even two weeks. So you really have to pay attention to what the plant needs and therefore the size of the pot and where you place it. Here we've got little tiny decorative um, teapot, tea uh, cups with bulbs in them. So that's going to be a very short, desirable time. But again, when you plant these, you may put them in a back area that you don't see. And only when you see that the blooms are coming up, do you actually go ahead and uh, bring them into your area where you can enjoy them. Here is um, hydrangeas that do like some 
direct sun, but like very early in the morning. Um, and then the rest of the day in the shade, bright, very bright shade. And so that's what this gets. Um, this is very early in the morning, and then the sun goes behind the house, and consequently they are all shaded. Next to that is a little mini rose that is in a pretty big pot. This is probably a nine or 10 inch wide pot in the same thing depth, but it's right on the edge of a raised bed right next to um, more of the plants in the bed. So consequently, every time the bed gets watered, the rose gets watered. Um, so consequently, that's a very nice way to encourage you not to forget a particular plant when you are watering it. And here we have bromeliads as hair. So here's a, a large pot. This is similar, um, maybe 20 inches across and 20 inches deep, uh, similar to the a uh, kumquat that had the succulents in it. And what you're dealing with is one um, perennial artichoke that is, it could last 15, 20 years if it's kept sufficiently uh, watered and fertilized. And the roots like with that kumquat tree are concentrated at the bottom half or three quarters of the container. Whereas at the top six inches or so, there's all these herbs, which um, here's the um, opal basil. We've got some oregano, um, maybe some another kind of basil in the back here, certainly another one back here. So those are all like six inches deep at the very most. And consequently, they all the foliage covers the soil so that there's less evaporation and the gravity carries the moisture that you do water down toward the bottom of the pot, which is then what um, the artichoke appreciates. Okay, um, seeds or transplants. Um, you can do both, but what you need to pay attention to, I think, just because you're going to be enjoying the pot is that you want things that are going to be looking good and yielding a lot of food. So what you would like best is seeds that germinate and grow quickly. And this is like lettuce here. Um, here I planted a transplant from a six, um, six pack and also the little lettuces from the seeds that I scattered there. And by the time that I will harvest the lettuce, and by the way, it's harvesting just by choosing the outer leaves rather than the um, picking the entire plant. That way the plant keeps growing from the little tiny leaves at the very center and you just harvest the outer leaves. Then by the time that is completely done, the seeded lettuce will have gotten large and you could transplant them and get yet another crop to it. So the thing about using transplants is that you want that for the plants that are going to take a long while to develop to the point where they actually start bearing their food. So eggplant, pepper, tomatoes, and most flowers fall into that category. Uh, again, you can sow those seeds 
but keep the container out of the way somewhere where you don't have to look at the fact that it's just barely growing and then bring it out when it is doing something really, um, it's got a fully developed plant to it and it's starting to do the, um, produce the fruit. They are, you're growing for the eating of it. So that's what I mean by using, utilizing both the seeds and the transplants. So the vegetables that are the highest yield, you know, for a plant, um, getting the most food off of it is going to be the beans, um, beets, broccoli, carrots, lettuces, peppers, radishes, squash, and tomatoes. I'm going to go ahead and put the um, the Google form in the chat and just go ahead and fill that out. So watering. I think everybody should be aware that more plants are killed in containers and in the ground by overwatering than underwatering. I think uh, especially during our COVID times here and beginning gardeners are just wanting to commune with their plants and that mistakenly also has them watering the plant. And consequently, uh, we end up with a lot of drowned plants. So here are some of the guidelines about watering. The larger, deeper containers moderate the soil temperature. Just like in, when it's in the ground, that's connected literally with the rest of the earth, um, it also moderates the temperatures. And moderating the soil temperature is, is just like when you are more comfortable with um, 70 degrees instead of 90 degrees, um, or perhaps you are, unless you're one of the real heat lovers, um, that is going to make the roots of the plant much more comfortable in, in with its environment in order to um, develop nicely and be able to pick up the moisture and the uh, fertilizers in order to feed the plant. So larger, deeper containers, because they have all that more space for the root zone, uh, do moderate the soil temperature and consequently um, the watering becomes a much less um, uh, problematic for the plant. Now, double potting moderates it even more. If you remember that uh, dark blue container that had the red rose in it, um, it had the pot that drained inside of that uh, glazed pot that did not drain. And what you can do is put uh, sphagnum moss or potting mix or anything else in between those two pots. And consequently, it becomes more like a, um, an insulation uh, for the pot that has the plant in it and has the roots growing. And consequently, it is more comfortable you really want to use your finger as a measure. And by finger, I mean your first finger here. And uh, if, if it's in a pot, you're just going down a good three inches. And at the base of your tip of your finger, if the potting soil is still moist, you don't want to water. If it's dry, then you want to water. So each time um, you're thinking that maybe you should be watering, um, do that measurement with your finger. And water slowly, um, especially with a large container that is out in the sun, 
the potting mix as it gets watered and then as it dries out as it should it um, the molecules the little pieces of the potting mix kind of lock together and consequently when you water it it may just go to the outer side of the pot and go all the way down to the bottom and out the bottom hole instead of actually moistening the potting soil itself. And an example of that double potting or a variation of it is this batch here. This small container on top is planted with mint and it's just set onto the soil surface of the middle pot, which is, um, looks like it's parsley. And that is set on the potting mix that is in the bottom container, which is the cilantro and the basil. So any water that goes in the top one, then if whatever is more than it can be absorbed, it goes into the second pot. And that one then fills up and then it goes down to the third pot and any that is excess here runs out through the bottom. So this really is a good use of the water because it all goes just down serving all of these containers, I'm sorry, serving all of these plants until it gets down to the bottom. And that's where you can put a, a drip pan, which I'll talk about in a minute. Or now, this is different than some of the pots that are called strawberry pots because it's a big thing that has the um, uh, like little openings all around the pot because that tends to run all the way down without serving those uh, plants on the top the water goes straight down to the bottom of the container. So I, recognize, I recommend not utilizing those, but more like this kind of a system where the water really has to stay within this pot and just go out through the small hole at the bottom. When water runs down the pot, you know, on the inside edge, the soil mix is too dry. And that's where I had talked about before, where the thing to do is to um, just cultivate the top soil a bit so that it will indeed absorb the water that you put in there. And then during the summer, it's a good idea to put a drip pan underneath this so that as the water ex exits at the bottom of this one, it goes into the drip pan and it will then be reabsorbed within a day. Um, you don't want to have the drip pan there during the winter when it rains or previous to this year when it didn't really rain. Um, we here in Pasadena got just a bit under six inches of rain and we should have had at least double that, more like triple that. So of course, um, the winter when it should be raining, uh, the water goes all the way through and out the bottom. So you don't want a drip pan because uh, it then would just keep it too moist. So fertilizing is another issue. Um, again, because you've got a captive plant, you really do need to provide the nutrition for it. And so on a, on a container, um, whether it's manure or bat guano or a box that says it's tomato food, um, it'll have three main numbers. And the first one is always nitrogen and that promotes the green foliage. If you're just growing, you know, like lettuce or uh, herbs that are just going to be like cilantro and parsley that you're just growing for the greenery, then nitrogen is really all you need. And that's the one that um, 
escapes most in soils and potting mix. The second number is the phosphorus. And that is the one that is not only general growth of the plant, but literally the strong roots. And that's what you want developing first of all, is making an established uh, root system. The third number is potassium. And that one is, again, for the general growth of the plant, but also for the flowers and the fruit. So those three are the major uh, nutrients, but you also want the trace nutrients in there. And those are all the little bits of things that, um, that really make a healthy plant. Um, and organic fertilizers are the ones that do include um, all of those trace nutrients. And those might be the fish emulsion, the seaweed, kelp, blood meal, and bone meal. The other option you have of organic fertilizers is um, Whitney Farms and Dr. Earth are two brands that come both in the boxed um, version and in a bigger bag version for, um, for more quantity of um, uh, more quantities of plants that have to be fed. Um, I recommend not utilizing the instant things like miracle Grow, uh, just because um, the analogy I use is that miracle Grow is like you're eating a whole cake on Sunday night and then not getting any food until next Sunday night when you get another cake. Okay, and of course, we all know how that feels. Uh, you get this burst of sugar high, and then you're crashing. And of course, there's no food until next Sunday night. Whereas with the organic fertilizers, um, you get a little bit all the time that are breaking down and you are able to pick them up. So it's like having a little tiny snacks every always available for you every day, all day long. But the snacks that are good food, you know, not chips, right? So um, it makes it a lot easier for the plant to stay healthy and consequently be able to offset any diseases or pests um, that might be there um, just floating around. Uh, but it's not susceptible to any of those because it is having a healthy meal um, just incrementally available or available always there so that it can pick it up um, incrementally just as it needs it. So my suggestion is that you use a quarter strength dose every other time you water. Or what I've ended up doing is an eighth strength every time I water. Because frankly, I can't remember sometimes, did I water that plant or did I feed that plant? And how long ago was it and all that? So I just make up a batch of very, very diluted strength, but I do it every time I water. So now, those are all the whys and wherefores and what's to think about. Um, this batch is, is some fun containers uh, that you may decide to uh, create yourself or in the nature of uh, recycling items and repurposing things, um, you may find containers that you didn't know you had, or at the next garage sale you go to. Um, well, I don't know, can we do garage sales yet? Not so much, um, but when you can, that you'll see items that you can use as containers. So here, um, I don't know if any of you are young enough to, uh, or I should say old enough, um, to remember when coffee came in cans. 
Well, that's what these are. This person has painted all of them blue, um, uh, connected them to the wall and planted their various plants in them. So it makes a nice design. Here's a uh, coffee maker carafe uh, with just enough ventilation to it here so that these uh, can be humid loving plants. Here is a uh, light fixture that hung over someone's uh, dining table, I would expect, that they have turned upside down and used instead of the um, uh, light bulbs in each of these containers, they've upended them and planted plants in there so that they have a nice hanging plants. Here are some lumber. Uh, somebody's uh, sawed a, a trunk that apparently was rotted in the center and broke apart. Um, they put potting mix in there and planted plants. Definitely a natural pot. Here's some oversized cups that have big plants in them. A swan with some nice little succulents. A wicker basket um, with a batch of herbs in there. Now one note here, if you just planted them right in the basket after just one year, the whole thing would have rotted out. So what this gardener has done was gotten four mil um, plastic sheeting and just uh, lined the entire uh, wicker basket with that right up to the edge. And then she waters on the inside. So of course she does have to be careful that she's um, not watering too much because it would be filling up with uh, water or she may have punched just one or two drainage holes in the bottom for the excess water. Here is what used to be a packing box uh, with the wood sides and has um, chard or beets growing in here. How about a bathtub? It of course has its own drainage hole at the base. A bureau. Truck tires. Um, these of course were sold years ago, I remember at Home Depot and uh, everybody loved them because they were the first on the market where you could actually stabilize a hillside, but still have these openings for the plants to be able to be grown in there in order that they should um, get large and hang down nicely so it would camouflage the actual um, concrete bricks that were being used. Um, pots that are of the same design and the consistency of the plants, um, and then set right on top of more trunks. A toolbox for anyone who uh, knits. This is a great idea with the um, knit containers with the potting mix in there. And then in this case, lots of succulents that don't mind being dried for weeks on end, but also um, do very nicely in the knitted bags. An old time uh, wheelbarrow planted. old cars, and even being able to take your garden with you here. This was something that craftspeople came up with uh, many years ago for uh, 
Halloween and Thanksgiving um, with the uh, glue sticks. And here's another um, ladybug out of truck tires. Even a pair of jeans with succulents and a frame hung with succulents. You'll see on here that it has the chicken wire or a little larger holes that is strung across and stabilized. And then the potting mix is behind it. And that's what the succulents are fed into so that they grow out from that. But the roots are behind them down there. And consequently, um, they can put it on a wall once it has grown its uh, a bit of its roots to anchor itself. And all these hairdresses shoes. Now, of course, these had excellent drainage just by virtue of the style of the shoe. The rest of these all would need, um, you know, punching a hole in the bottom for the drainage or else just being really careful about how much they're watering it and then dumping the excess water. And that's it. Here's the fantasy container gardening. Now this one is not my photograph. This I got online, but I thought this just bespeaks what we all really would love to have in our, our home. So that's it. A little short of time, but then we can uh, ask some questions. Very beautiful. Round of applause for Yvonne using those emojis. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of questions from the chat, if you don't mind answering them. Sure. The first one is Do you have any advice on aphids? Aphids. <laughs> sure. Um, aphids love really new growth that is tender and succulent. So now is the best time for them because all this new growth coming up. Um, if you can, for the future, um, try not to feed your plants too much at the beginning when they are just starting to grow, because that is what those aphids love. Um, and many times, um, especially on roses, um, they just go crazy. But if you don't feed it so much, it will grow very nicely, but it won't be attacked by all these pests that love this tender growth. Now, getting rid of the aphids that you have right now, there's a couple of things. Um, if you're not squeamish, um, you just, you know, if this is the branch, you just go like this and you just squish them. If you are squeamish and you just as soon not get as close as that to your aphids, um, if this is your plant, then put your hand right behind it and then spray it with a jet stream of water. Your hand is really um, helping the plant not get completely blown over or broken right up against it. But what happens with this direct stream of water is that it literally knocks them off of the plant and they fall to the ground. Now they won't climb back up because what happens is that they have literally locked into the branch of the plant. I mean, they've, they've taken a bite of it, okay? They're connected. So when you blast it with that water, it knocks them off, but it leaves their heads here. So they literally do not have a head anymore. So they're dead, okay? So, 
that may be the best way, even for like a house plant, um, just as long as you're kind of protecting the plant by giving it something to brush up against without getting blasted apart. So whether it's a rose bush or a begonia or a tomato plant or whatever it is, just do that same thing. So mine specifically are my cruciferous vegetables, my cauliflower, my broccoli. That is what those aphids, I mean, actually the aphids have almost completely destroyed my broccoli plants, <laughs> but I'm trying to save my cauliflower and they have just taken that cauliflower on like it's their new hobby. I mean, they've just- Hey, okay, you're providing lunch, you know, what's <laughs> not the like? But it's supposed okay. to be my lunch, not the aphids' I know. lunch. I know. But they always get it two days before you want to pick it. They sure um, do. <laughs> okay. Um, broccoli is more difficult than cauliflower, but I'll tell you some suggestions were to cut the uh, broccoli head, um, you know, whatever size it was, um, and put uh, soak it in a bath that has both filled with water, but maybe half a cup of vinegar you know, just regular white vinegar or cider vinegar, whatever you've got. And then you kind of swash it around in there. And what happens is that the vinegar, of course, they don't like. So they try to get out from wherever they are in that broccoli or on the, the leaves or the cauliflower. And I found that that worked to a good extent. But even then, when I would cook it, I would end up with lots more aphids, you know, now dead, of course, but floating around on the water. So I really felt that um, aside from just getting a little more protein in my diet, oh dear. I really didn't want to have to deal, especially if I'm serving it for friends, you know, or people that don't understand. Um, so then what I came up with is that I literally pick the head, but I also cut it into all of its bite-sized pieces. And the smaller, the better. And then put that in this water and vinegar bath and rinse it several times before there are no more of the aphids in there. And then you've got it cut up already, you know, for to be able to um, either throw in a salad or stir fry it or however you want. Um, and of course you can always, uh, you know, blend it all up in order to make soup or something. Um, but for being able to serve it and having it be recognizable in pieces, then it's just a matter of cutting it up into those smaller pieces, but still utilizing that um, vinegar, um, bath in order to get rid of the aphids. Yeah, I did initially try to use diatomaceous earth around the plants in on the topsoil. Um, they just seemed to walk right over it. So I don't, <laughs> that was my plan A and my plan A didn't work. So yeah, well, blasting it with the water will be, you know, and if you can reach with the water up into, you know, the way both of them are uh, on a stem, and then it's the flower, the immature flower head. If you can blast the water up in there, yeah, um, that'll get them as soon as you see it, be, see them, because you know there will all just be more populations accumulating as they all decide this is the best thing to eat. Mm -hmm. um, just going ahead and harvesting it. Um, you know, broccoli will go ahead and put out more of the shoots, the side shoots, whereas the cauliflower is a one-time thing. So you may have a very small head of cauliflower um, in order to harvest that you just can't help unless you want to wait longer and then do more of that, cutting it up into pieces. But in terms of growing, um, it's, it's just having less rich with nitrogen soil um, for all your vegetables, just so that they, um, they don't have to absorb that and consequently be victim to the, the aphids. 
Um, you know, the, the thing, whether or not anybody has a question, the, um, I did want to mention the ladybugs, purchasing the ladybugs um, yes. and then, you know, releasing them. The only success you're going to have is when you purchase them as soon as you see that they are available in the nursery, preferably that they're refrigerated because these guys are harvested up in the Sierras in Northern California. And so of course their first reaction is going to be they're hungry and they wanna fly away home, okay? So what you need to do is get them as fresh as you possibly can. But then a couple things in the garden. You want to release them at night or you know, later in the evening. Um, and you want to have watered the entire garden, um, especially those plants that have lots of aphids. And then you release them right underneath those plants that have the aphids. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is you're providing the moisture that they want. It's getting to me nighttime and they're gonna be settling down for the night instead of thinking of flying away home, and you've provided their food source. You've provided them with breakfast, lunch, and dinner right there. And consequently, they will stay overnight at least and eat everybody up the next morning before potentially flying away. But you have to recognize that that's where they came from. And there is one of Huell Hauser's programs that he does on um, harvesting of the um, ladybugs up in the Sierra. And so that's, that's how I knew that that's what's going on and this is the research that I had done since then through the university, just recognizing that that is consistent. You know, that is where they all come from. Mm -hmm. So giving them what they want and doing it at nighttime will at least give you an overnight and a first thing in the morning um, eating up the um, aphids that you do have. I used ladybugs. I'm sorry, preventing the problem in the first place by virtue of less um, covering the place with nitrogen is going to be um, more helpful, you know, yeah, than trying to solve the problem afterwards. Yeah, that's where I failed. <laughs> well, now you know how to a, a new new approach for next time. I'm ready. <laughs> so we actually have another question from Precious, and she's asking. Um, yeah, I see to... on there. It's the same thing. Just okay. take your uh, blast of water, you know, and put the the leaves that are right have the aphids and just blast them off right there. Just get them so they fall to the ground and they won't be able to do anything after that. If you use dish soap, like if you dilute it in some water, does that kind of, with maybe some vinegar, would that also help? Well, you don't want to use vinegar sprayed in the garden because then you're going to be acidifying your soil. Okay. And you don't want to necessarily do that. Um, you know, most, um, it's about 6.5, the, the pH scale that is uh, ideal for vegetables. And you don't want to be making it more acidic than that because then the, all the vegetables will be um, having more of a problematic time. Mm -hmm. And then another, an, another note on the um, nitrogen and especially with tomato plants, a lot of times people will complain that they have great looking tomato plants, but there's no blossoms and no, no fruit um, later on in the season. And this may be because they have fed it too much nitrogen because that's just for the greenery. And what you really want is a good substantial plant, but you want it to be uh, having the 
phosphorus and potassium in order to set the blossoms and get them pollinated and then of course develop into fruit. So when you um, are using like a metal container, um, would you recommend that or does it get really hot? Um, yeah, it would. Unless okay. you're, you're keeping it in a shady area, mm -hmm. you know, like maybe for a begonia or something that needs to be in a, um, a shadier area, that would be okay. Or you could do, if it's a really large pot, you could do the pot in a pot and then have, um, you know, more potting mix or uh, sphagnum moss or something in between so that the, the pot that the plant is in is insulated from the big pot. Right. But again, be concerned about the, um, the drainage of the water going into the metal pot, because if it sits in there, you know, for years, it's not only going to spoil, but it's going to rot the pot out. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm wondering if anyone else has questions to ask Yvonne or comments to share. Feel free to type them in the chat or unmute yourself. There is uh, the presentation we had, uh, what was it, a week ago, um, which was just general growing of vegetables. Um, those of you who were not part of that, you might like to um, see another presentation I had made with the same information uh, that's on my web links uh, page on my website. And on the extreme right-hand column under Yvonne's web appearances, just scroll down till you see one that is vegetables. Um, and that'll have the general growing conditions um, that you might want to be able to get started. Um, and also on my blog, on my page, um, on the right-hand side, there is my search bar. So you can put in like container gardening or whatever topic you want. And then any of the discussions that I've made in my blogs over all the years, those will come up. So then you uh, can get different um, thoughts about that. Because I have periodically, um, I don't just talk about what's going on in my garden that week. Um, sometimes it's really a much more substantial article um, and so consequently, there might be one of those that you can find easily just by scrolling, uh, putting the term in the uh, search bar and then scrolling through all the, the links that do come up. And if you have some question, then, you know, just email me as well. Thank you for that. I, d I put the links that you were mentioning in the chat. So if anyone would like to use those, oh, free, just click on them. And I'm, does anyone have any other questions or last yes. questions? <laughs> yes, feel free. So I grew a avocado tree from a seed and it got to be actually pretty big. And so we put it in one of those um, wooden tree pots, you know, that they, that they come in in the nursery. Right. And so there was a tree in our front yard that had rotted and we took it out of its spot. We dug up the roots and everything. And we put in some soil, like some tree soil in there in the hole. And then we planted the avocado tree there but it doesn't seem to like its new home. So I'm kind of concerned that maybe whatever happened to the previous tree is now eating my avocado tree. <laughs> Does that yeah, sound? It, it may in fact be because even though you put um, more soil or organic matter of any kind, um, the microorganisms in the new soil will be able to deal with and offset the problems that were there from the previous tree. However, it may take 10, 20, 30 years. 
um, you know, this stuff moves really slowly, or I should say they eat really slowly. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it may be that you have planted it in a, an already problematic soil mix. Um, the other uh, consideration is that anytime you grow a fruit from a seed, you are not going to get the same thing as what you ate because this is a sexual process of propagation yeah. that it may or may not come up with any variations of what those avocados were because it's a sexual propagation. Yes. So if you just took the cutting of a branch and you rooted that, then it would be exactly the same fruit as you ate. It's called mm -hmm. cloning. Um, but that was, uh, so you may or may not even with, if that tree survives and thrives, um, in another five, 10 years, you may have fruit that you don't particularly like, or you may have fruit that is great. You never know. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> and then if you love it, you might be able to patent it and get lots of money for it. Oh, all righty then. I'll be on and the lookout for that in 10 years. There you go. You got to look <laughs> at the bright side of it all, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Because that's what happened with the Haas avocado, you know, the one that is basically the, the avocado that is in all the markets um, with the black pebbly skin. That was a, an offshoot of a tree from a guy down in La Habra whose name was Haas. And so he named it for himself and he ended up um, you know, getting all of the, um, the money that was needed and legal uh, paperwork and all that stuff to patent it. And now, of course, he's, um, I don't know if he's still alive, but he, that process really works. So you never know. You're going to hear about the reedy avocado in 10 years, guys. All right, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Yvonne. You are a wealth of knowledge. Well, you know, as I used to tell the, the master gardeners when they would get all excited because I'd go babbling on about something and marvel at how much I knew. Well, the reason I know so much is that I've killed more plants than you guys ever knew existed. And consequently, you know, well, that magic didn't work. Now what can I do? So it's, it's all a matter of playing with your plants and just reading a lot of stuff, but taking everything into a, a kind of with a, a grain of salt, so to speak. Um, and that's one reason I do my blog because this information is really for us. It's not something that's from the East Coast or the Midwest and it has no bearing whatsoever but you as a beginning gardener have no way of knowing any of that. So I'm glad that it's of help and that uh, I love uh, answering people's concerns. So even if I don't uh, have the experience myself, I'll make something up that fits. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for all the wonderful information that you provided. And You're welcome. We're about to hit our 15 minute mark. So I just want to hand it over to Ryan. So he has enough time to announce the raffle winners. Yes, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We have this little wheel going on here. I think you guys are going to like the look of this. <laughs> can you, can everyone see this? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Okay, cool. All right. So this is everyone who um, entered into the raffle. So we're just going to spin it five times. And actually, let me get a piece of paper so I can write down the names of the winners. All right. Oh, oh I didn't even mean to click it. All right, Bianca. <laughs> okay, congratulations. Thank you. So, Thank you. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I will email the winners of the raffle. Um, 
after I get in touch with Dina. Um, and then we will send a little list of what we recommend in terms of container gardening. And I'm gonna send that to some of the other people who entered, but unfortunately didn't get the, the gift cards. All right. Uh, Bianca, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> oh, I love that there's a little applause with that. Are you see? okay? Okay, okay, hold on, hold on. <laughs> No, there has to be something wrong with that. Try removing, uh, Wait, what was that? Try removing the name. Oh, no, no, there it is. All right, Julia, congratulations. Thank you. I'll remove. All right, um, I believe this is Melissa Rodriguez. Congratulations. All right, uh, Nala or Naya, congratulations. Thank you. All right, last person. Oh, oh dang, <laughs> congratulations, Melissa. Number two. All right, thank you everyone. I will um, be emailing the winners of the raffle uh, to get your gift cards. Uh, thank you all so much for coming today and thank you Yvonne for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. We're so thankful for it. Thank you, Crystal. Um, all right, anything you wanted to say, Estefania? Oh yes, just to piggyback off what you said, thank you everyone for sticking around and for showing up to listen to Yvonne's presentation. Hopefully the notes that we put in the chat were helpful and you can review them anytime once you start your gardening preparation. And if you ever have any questions or you wanna rewatch the recording, we're gonna be sending that out uh, shortly. So just look, be on the lookout for that. Definitely. And follow the EPC and Edible Garden Club on Instagram for more events coming up. All right, thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you.